All right, cool. So I'm going to jump in here. Um, again, I'm Alex Bakovsky. I'm the host of this inside session, and I'm joined today by Margaret and Kim, Margaret McGuffin and Kim Temple. And I want to thank you both for being here today um, to discuss the Woman in the Studio National Accelerator Program with me. It's going to be amazing. Super excited. Thanks um, for the invite. Of course. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Totally. Um, just a little about the Woman in the Studio program in general. Um, before we delve further into that, it was founded, created by Music Publishers Canada. And um, I think what I'd love to do, uh, just so that we can intro a little bit, you know, Margaret and Kim, just some backstory. Um, if either one of you want to jump into just a little bit about yourselves, what it is you do and, you know, anything, anything really you feel relevant, that would be fabulous. Um, Margaret, if you wanted to go ahead first, that'd be awesome. Hi, everybody. I am Margaret McGuffin. I'm CEO of Music Publishers Canada. So our, we are a trade organization that's over 70 years old. And primarily, we've been involved in lobbying. I talk to politicians all the time about copyright and, and why composers, songwriters, and and uh, music publishers need to get paid more and talk a lot about copyright and um, CRTC broadcasting policy. And uh, when I started seven years ago, we started at Music Publishers Canada rebranding to our new, new this new name, but also um, trying to um, look at what programs we can offer um, first to our members. And so those are export programs and a research studies and, and the lobbying that we were doing. But we also wanted to look at our, our corporate res social responsibility um, within the bigger community. And that, as a result, we've founded um, several new programs, um, one being our, our Women in the Studio uh, Accelerator five years ago. Amazing. Love that. And Kim, I don't know if you wanted to go ahead just a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Kim Temple, and I'm Senior Manager of Programming and Industry Relations at Music Publishers Canada. Uh, I also am a music publisher, so I split my time between MPC and a record label in Toronto called Six Shooter Records, and I have a publishing company called High Priestess Publishing. So I'm coming at this really from having started in the music industry as a musician. I was a drummer, a touring drummer, played in bands, uh, always worked in film and television production and loved the marriage of those two things, music in film and television and other uses. Uh, and lo and behold, ended up becoming a music publisher, which I don't think I knew what that was when I was in high school. I wasn't like, I'm going to become a music publisher, but that's sort of where my path led me. And so now I am the publisher at a record label and also uh, working with Margaret at the Trade Association. Yeah, and I think, Kim, it's a good point. Um, but what's a music publisher? I think the composing um, non-artist songwriter and, and uh, music publishing um, it's the secret part of the music industry that uh, has a superpower, but uh, managers and labels don't know as much as they should about all those things. And and what we've been trying to do over the last few years is also try to shine a spotlight on what music publishers do, who composers are. And, and we hold an event once a year called Inside the Song, where we focus on, uh, on songwriters um, and producers who are not the artist and may not be part of the artist project. Um, to demystify co-writing and and production. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like um, that demystifying process in general, um, at least on my journey, you know, because as I as you know, I was a part of the inaugural year of the um, WITS program. The demystifying of what it looks like to occupy those spaces, like music composer, music producer, um, I think was really kind of you know, vital, at least to my journey um, in harnessing um, those powers uh, in order to um, bring those spaces to fruition, you know, and it's an on ongoing development for sure. But I think that initial catalytic moment um, really kind of aided me um, at that point and phase of my journey. So yeah, thank you so, so much um, for joining me here today to chat. Um, I'm looking forward to discussing uh, the Women in the National, the Studio National Accelerator Program and the ways in which it can help emerging mid-level 
women, women identifying and non-binary music composers, producers, and artists uh, gain more footing and real life experience in the industry. Um, following our chat today, by the way, anyone who's tuned in, we'll take a bit of time for any Q&A elements from those who've, who are here. And to our wonderful viewers, if you've got any questions, maybe jot them down for that time so you can keep track. Um, and also, Margaret, uh, I don't know if you wanted to touch on a little bit more about Music Publishers Canada before we jump into the Women in the Studio specific content, but if not, totally great. But if you wanted to maybe touch on MPC a little bit more. Yeah, um, just a couple of things. Um, we're really interested in uh, working cross-sectorally. So we're I spend a lot of my time working with the Screen Composers Guild and the Songwriters Association of Canada with SOCAN and CMRA, um, as well as um, other industries. And so we're spending a lot of time these days talking to video game uh publishers and and in the interactive space because we know there's a huge amount of music discovery um, on those platforms and not as many com Canadian composers or Canadian songwriters are finding their home in the Canadian productions not as much as what's happening on the international stage and I think this is a real opportunity for growth um, for all of you and for the sector and and we we just want to get in the face of, of these uh, video game uh, publishers and say, hey, listen to some Canadian songwriters and composers because I think there's a lot of opportunity here. So mm -hmm. we do things like that. We're also very proud of our new next gen program. Um, I feel very strongly that we need to be training and mentoring the next generation of, of music publishers. Um, I go to so many events for so many years and see all the same people and 18 months ago, we launched um, um, the Next Gen program. And suddenly we had 80 people in a room and I didn't know 60 of them. And um, with nurturing that group, we're finding um, a new energy. And um, this year in our strategic plan, so much of our programming is coming from that Next Gen group. And I think it's it's really healthy, healthy for us as an association and really promising for what music publishing is going to look like in 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 the next few years and, and onward. Amazing. I love that. I think too, um, you know, uh, the AWFC really, and I think MPC, there's a big alignment in sharing of the values of ensuring there are workshop opportunities, intensive opportunities, you know, songwriting, composing, producing camps, all of these elements are so vital to that ongoing development and dialogue that exists within the space. So just hearing about next gen as well. I mean, hmm, future topics, future inside session chat topics. I don't know. You tell yeah, me. Yeah, and I, I think Alex, um, we were also talking before we came on about the international um, yes. nature of music publishing and and songwriting and um, when I uh, was researching the, this industry as a consultant 18 years ago only 25% of the revenue from music publishers in Canada was coming from foreign sources it's now 71% so we're actually growing yeah. um, revenue coming in for Canadian composers songwriters and music publishers by really taking Canadian songs and scores around the world and it's really changing what's going on and it's building a better industry yeah amazing that's and also that's such a that's a leap 25 to 71 percent that's not that's nuts wow okay yeah um fabulous so on that note I'd love to jump more into talking you know I'd like to go over kind of bullet points bullet points of uh, what the Women in the Studio, WITS, really is and just the nature of the beast. Um, so, sure. you know, would either of you, maybe Kim, would you like to speak to a general synopsis for what the Women in the Studio program really is? For sure. I, it's really morphed uh, over the past five years. So you were in the first cohort, uh, Alex, and we had five um, producer songwriters. And we do keep songwriting as a big element of the programming because it's coming from the music publishing perspective. So it's not just teaching uh, production skills and giving mentors and workshops. On the production side, we also really want songwriting and co-writing to be a big part of it as well. 
um, which I think is very attractive to composers because generally speaking, composers kind of work in a in isolation or they're sitting in their home studio composing to picture and co-writing or writing, even writing like pop songs or songs in different genres. You know, sometimes as a composer, you get a little bit pigeonholed and you're working on all these Christmas movies mm -hmm. or something and you're like, maybe yeah. I want to write in other genres or I need source cues for certain pieces that I'm working mm -hmm. on. So um, uh, we do find the composers who apply for our program are really interested in the collaboration and the industry networking part. Um, but overall, uh, the way our, our programming has evolved is really interesting because we started with five producers who were Ontario based and then the pandemic hit and we went to virtual programming, which allowed us to bring in bigger cohorts, but also mentors from far away and you know everything was virtual so we really expanded the network very quickly during that time um, but then when we came back to in person um, it really was beautiful to bring everyone together in one place it was New York once and it was you know Toronto a couple of times just so they could actually meet each other and sit in studios together and learn together and collaborate and share ideas. So um, we have also found the skill level has evolved pretty increment, like exponentially, I would say from, you know, we started in the first year with a lot of self-producing artists who were maybe thinking about calling themselves producers or had a little bit of imposter syndrome and weren't really sure um, mm -hmm. if they were ready to produce for other people. And now we call ourselves a mid-level program because now we've found it's uh, it's from coast to coast, it's national program and the kinds of submissions we're getting are people who are opening their own studios or have you know audio production engineering degrees or have already produced song uh, albums for others and have been co-writing and have been composing for AV. So, so it's really becoming a, a very advanced group. But what I love about this program is we can also customize, you know, everybody's coming in at different levels, working in different digital audio workstations and looking for different types of mentorship. So while we do have collective group activities and twice a month, uh, we will bring everybody together virtually to learn from a panel of industry or experts or you know associate other associations but um what mm -hmm. we really can do now is also go in and customize say you know Alex what is it that you're really looking for out of this program and how can mm -hmm. we help find you the right mentor or the right people to talk to for those the skill set you're looking for cool I love that oh. so it's very yeah yeah. I'll just jump in there. Um, so we originally started this because we started looking at the USC Annenberg study out of uh, out of the US that only between two and three percent of all of the top 100 billboard albums were being only two percent to three percent were being um, produced by women. And um, unfortunately, I don't think that's changed much mm -hmm. in the in the five years. So only about three percent of the songs you're hearing produced by women in binary and gender fluid producers. And that's a problem. So we wanted to help. And it's good for publishers to help because they want a more diverse roster when they're signing songwriters and producers. So there's there's so many reasons for us to enter into the space. And the first year you were in, Alex, it was very event focused. We brought you to CMW, we brought you to New York, we brought you to the Junos. Um, and as Kim said, COVID was an opportunity because suddenly we learned how to do good virtual programming. So now the program is seven months long. There is a one week residency in Toronto. There's twice a month sessions um, um, virtually and we're able to customize. So we have a mid, we have a, we set out expectations in an initial meeting and then we survey all the way through and midpoint we say, what do you want for the rest of the program? And often the producers have changed what they want. So our basic program is um, te technical training by Dr. Amandine Pra, who's become sort of our in-house specialist. And she can teach anyone of any skill level, which is very rare um, on any DAW. 
Um, she has her PhD in sound engineering um, from France. And then, and she's amazing. And, but we have creative opportunities. We arrange for co-write opportunities, but th there's a business side to this too. So we bring in a branding expert. We um, have financial literacy training with RBC. We, we look at how to build, <laughs> start looking at how to build a small business. Um, what you need to do about your accounting. Um, so it's very holistic in the different areas that we uh, touch yeah. on. Yeah, I think that's um, that's really, I mean, that's developed then since when I was, you know, my year for sure. I think we touched on elements like that, but it's really great also to hear about that midway checkpoint um, because that that's such a good point that, even though the initial at the initial offset, you may have one objective going into the program that can shift and develop. And um, as you absorb from other cohorts as well and other experiences, a part of, you know, the programming, that compass can kind of uh, change a little bit. And I think that's um, really kind of cool to be able to hear real time feedback and that sort of review process. Um, we're, we've touched on, which is great too. So the length is seven months um, for the actual program. And it's been going on for five years. For prospective interested applicants submitting, what are some of the overall elements that one should keep in mind when applying? So this is a mid-level, this is a mid-level sort of caliber, you know, experienced, um, that's my understanding, you know, submission process. Mm -hmm. And how might prospective applicants best prepare when submitting in March, right. right? Yeah, that's right. In March, uh, we send out the call for applications through our socials mainly. Um, and then we also do some, some outreach to other associations to spread the word and to music schools and, and, uh, other people in the industry. But, um, the application actually has evolved a lot too. It's changed quite a bit since the first year. So now we ask people to submit, we still ask people to submit links to songs that they have produced and co-written on. Um, we always ask people to explain why they're applying for the program and how they think the program can help them and why they think this is the right level for them because there's also for more entry level or people who are just starting to explore production, we tend to refer them to uh, the Equity X program at SOCAN Foundation. And then there are other, you know, there are different, there are a lot of these programs popping up right now. So we feel we are really focused on the producer songwriter element of it. Um, so we do look at, you know, are you submitting songs that you've produced for other people. It's okay to add some a self-produced song as well if you're an artist, but we want to know that you're serious about pursuing a career as a producer um, and as a songwriter, that you do have songwriting chops, that you have co-written. You're not just a 100% songwriter doing your own thing in your bedroom. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but we're looking really looking for collaboration here and for creating a community. So the great thing about being five years in is now we have grads like you who are coming back and interacting and teaching and mentoring the new mentees. And um, that's exactly what we wanted. We just wanted to create that kind of community. Um, so we do also like to hear from our past grads if there's anyone that they can do outreach to, to say, hey, you should really apply for this program. So the, the net is being cast much wider every year, which is great. Um, it's... Uh, maybe harder for our selections committee to sift through all of that. But um, but it's really encouraging because when we started this program, we just thought, well, how many self-identifying producers are there out there? Like how many people are actually going to put up their hand and say, I'm a producer. And we notice even when people start in the program and we make them do their elevator pitch and go around and introduce themselves every time we have mentors and industry come in and talk to them, everybody maybe at the start is a little uncomfortable calling them so they'll be like oh I'm a songwriter artist and uh I produce you know and then by the end of the program they're just owning it they're just saying I'm a producer songwriter composer you know here are the things I do this is the DAW I work in here are the things I've produced so it's really building on that confidence piece of you know as we talked about I think before we started recording just 
just have feeling like you can own it that you can go into a studio and call yourself a producer and sit in the producer's seat um mm -hmm. so something you mentioned actually in and the halfway point which is really interesting is we have a lot of songwriters who come in and artists who halfway through decide oh wow composing for audiovisual yeah. like i never really thought about that, that that's something maybe I could try. And then we have a lot of composers coming in saying, I've never written in a pop song camp. What's that all about? Like, I'm curious to see what that is. So it's nice to just sort of open up those streams of, you know, creativity and revenue. And, you know, maybe when you're a touring artist and you're in your down cycle, what else could you be doing to create new streams of revenue? Yeah. That's a really, I think that's an excellent point. I think, um, I think that, you know, speaking personally, sometimes um, the realization that um, one is occupying multiple spaces at once. And, you know, I, I make this joke, like I love wearing, you know, different hats, right. Or, mm -hmm. and then, and then I think if you zoom out of like the multiple hats wearing kind of uh, methodology, it actually is all existent under one umbrella, one space. It's a creative space. It's musical storytelling space. And I think um, that's a great point, how people may enter, you know, in one mindset space or one vein where they're like, this is the thing that I do or who I am. And that very well may be true. And that, you know, can, the continuation of that truth is ongoing, but then the realization that, oh, you know what, I can do a branch over here. I can do a little zigzag over here. And I'm now occupying this space as a producer or songwriter or composer. And the fact that it is all existent under this umbrella um, is the real, it's kind of freeing actually. And I think, yeah. you know- It's we'll actually, it's gonna build a more sustainable career because there are times where you're gonna to wanna to take, if you have an artist product, it'll be between artist projects or you're, you're starting your family or there unfortunately is illness that prevents you from pursuing that artist career. And if you can have different revenue sources you're going to have more certainty in your rep, your income. But also we saw during COVID, it was the composers and the songwriters who kept on working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because performance obviously was such a, yeah. I mean, I think that, um, I think, I mean, it's an intersectionality, right? Between the commerce and the passion. This is something that comes up, I think often just in general in the industry and in the landscape. Um, and so, you know, the reality of the situation is, especially, especially for women, women identifying gender fluid presence, the need for resourcefulness and flexibility, that Swiss army knife effect um, is so integral to carving out the space, occupying the space and maintaining presence in that space. Um, so the more multiple revenue streams you're able to have at your disposal, the stronger you become you know, as a creative. Absolutely. Too. Yeah. And your original question about the applicants, there's yeah. not one size fits all. So I encourage anybody listening to this to look at the program and apply. We have self-taught beat makers um, like uh, McKenna Dizzy, who was in the program two years ago. And we have trained people who have got degrees and diplomas and have been working um, Alisa Pensang had been working for over a decade in studios in Vancouver and still felt that the networking side of what we were offering built out her career. So there's not one type of producer who fits this program and we're able to customize the training to um, different types of people with different types of, of technical backgrounds. Oh, that's wonderful as well. I think um, the customization element doesn't always occur. Actually, I think it leans towards, it doesn't usually occur um, in uh, in the structure, I mean, of certain workshops, intensives, initiatives. And the fact that this is a seven month long um, experience, I think really also helps um, kind of that incubational period um, and that customizational, uh, you know, kind of process. So that's, that's fabulous. I mean, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about like the no secret of women, women identifying presence being a minority in the landscape. Why are programs like women in the studio so important in terms of that proverbial inching of the needle forward 
Well, we're Canadian, so the centimetering of the needle forward. Uh, I can start, Margaret. Feel feel free to jump in when you want, but um, I think it's so important for, I mean, the Canadian music industry, as you know, it's quite small. Globally, we are a small uh, population, although we are, we hit, what's the, what's the expression? We hit above our weight. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In the, weight. in the, in the music industry. Um, but I really do feel in order to survive, we need to diversify uh, who's creating the music, you know, who's in the studio, uh, what are the perspectives of the people writing the lyrics and who's singing the songs, you know, the authenticity piece. Like, I just think um, these programs take someone who has potential, but maybe doesn't have the confidence and gives them that boost and gives them the resources and gives them the network to go forth into not just you know, our national scene, but to travel, like we mentioned, you just went, you know, to Brazil and, you know, to go out onto the world stage and, and be able to represent and say, I'm here and I'm going to take up this space and I'm going to be writing songs that are authentic. You know, I think we know that a lot of billboard songs are written by men for teenage girls to sing. And, you know, that just doesn't really ring true anymore. So I think people are really after that authenticity piece and they want to see, more diverse representation in the music industry. So I think it all starts with a song, you know, we always say that. And, um, and I think that the people who are creating the songs and the spaces they're creating the songs in has to diversify. Yeah. And um, we're really wanting to keep the alumni really involved in this. And so much more of our work is about making sure our current cohort knows the alum, because it's great for networking, but it also, we, we try to create opportunities. And maybe Alex, I'm gonna reverse this and ask you um, to tell the group about um, uh, the song camp you just did in Brazil with CM. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I was invited to go to Rio, Brazil, which um, I'd never been actually before, which was very cool in general. Um, and uh, there was a, a three-day um, sort of programming, songwriting, and producing camp, and I went um, and represented Canada as a music producer, and um, it was a cross-pollination um, station where uh, we were interacting, meeting, and collaborating with different artists from literally all over the world. Um, actually, it was- All women, cool. too. All, all women, women awesome. all women, which was amazing. Women, women identifying. And yeah, um, it was uh, at Viasom Studios, which is uh, beautiful studios in Rio. And um, the music that we were creating was very interesting, actually, because, you know, I don't speak Portuguese. Um, I wish I did. That'd be super cool. Um, but it's English uh, and like a smattering of French. Um, and uh, we had you know, uh, these creatives, music artists, songwriters, who their primary speaking language was Portuguese. Uh, some of them spoke Spanish. Um, and so, you know, you want to talk about uh, international collaboration when you're sitting in a studio space, you know, producing out people who are literally writing, um, exchanging their ideas between English, you know, and Portuguese. Um, and I think one of the songs uh, that I created with Monica Velez, who she's like a two time Latin Grammy winning songwriter. She's amazing. Um, you know, we wrote one song in Spanglish. So it was like we had like the verses um, were all Spanish. And then the main primary hook kind of chorus motifs were in English, which was great for me because I could really understand what was being said. Um, but uh, yeah, it was I mean. That was on the creative front, really the the meat and potatoes. And then we also had, you know, um, kind of, you know, like mixer type things, which also lent more to that conversation of the networking. Um, and I use air quotes networking. It's relationship building, right? Like, I think that might even be really at the core, a better way to phrase it. It's, it's meeting people and interacting and you know, um, on a personal level, I had some, yeah, I had some like personal stuff come up on that trip for me. Um, and it was really amazing. The response, um, from 
everyone involved and you know you have like the professional wavelength um and then and then you know we are human beings so there's this personal wavelength that also exists and to be able to dial into the, the frequency of that and share on that frequency um with people that you've never really met before but you know you've collaborated creatively together was um remarkable um and just just yeah on a personal note i i was really touched um um by that so, but it was a, yeah, it was a great experience. It was Songwriters Association Canada, MPC, um, I think Global Affairs Canada, Government of Canada, um, like Heritage Canada, uh, were all involved um, with that. And yeah, I mean, one of the other producers, she was from, where is she from? Like Copenhagen, you know? So yeah. like literally all over, yeah, all over the planet. Um, so, so um I also have a question for you because I know sure. what the answer is for us but how do, I know you've done a lot of international song camps so how did it feel different for you to be in an all all woman space yes. like what how did that change the vibe for you and yeah yeah I think I think ultimately well so women have a different perspective. Um, let's go one step further. Everyone has a different perspective, but women, the lens of which women and women identifying and gender fluid look through, you know, we're coming at it from, we're talking about the occupying of space. And so I think everybody's looking through that lens, like, um, and have kind of on the journey all faced at, at some level, at some degree, um, the challenges that come with that. So I think for me, um, the knowledge that uh, that that was a shared um, aligned lens and vision, like headspace that everyone was interacting within um, and a comfortability, you know, like I felt very, very comfortable because kind of seen, right? Like, oh, we're here together. And that's, I think what, that's what made it special too, right? It's like, oh my gosh, you know, A, oh my gosh, finally something like this is happening, you know, all women, um, but quickly followed by, wow, all women think of all the possibilities, right? I think, uh, yeah. I, I uh, love that you said you felt seen or it helps you feel seen being surrounded by other women because, um, you know, that is exactly why I think our program and programs like ours are, is impor are important uh, because until you see somebody doing, you know, we've, we've brought in mentors like Sylvia Massey and Linda Perry and Dr. Susan Rogers and Jenna Andrews and various people come in and speak to our group. Um, you know, Leslie Barber being an amazing composer who came and did a masterclass for us. And when you see somebody who has achieved, you know, that level of success and you relate to, oh, you're, uh, you're like one of the uh, 2%, I guess, who have made it through, you know, um, it gives you that hope and that inspiration to, to think that you can also, somebody's already, blaze that trail or carve that path. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's easier to follow, but it gives you the courage and the strength to, to dream that you can do it and hopefully the perseverance to carry through with it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm hoping it's also changing the conversations in the studio. So coming back to Canada, um, we're seeing, we work with Honey Jam quite a bit this year and they're, they're, providing information about productions to their artists because um, at, at an, you know, a beginner phase, because they want those artists to be able to go into the studio and feel confidence in their conver conversation. And Kim, I just listened to your podcast with um, Rob Wells um, that profiles amazing women in the music industry. And you were talking about also, as we get more women into the, the studio spaces, it's going to change the dynamic of of what happens in the studio your feeling of safety in the in the studio um and you profiled um uh isabel Benes, who is in cave boy and has opened up her own studio in montreal and and her space is very different than a lot of the spaces you've seen do you want to talk about that a little bit kim about the safety and the the change in, yeah. in the spaces I mean, I can speak about it firsthand when I was a drummer playing in rock bands in the 90s and going into studio spaces. I was always, without exception, the only woman in the room. And uh, with the studio staff, the engineers, um, you know, generally even the receptionists were men <laughs> back then. So 
it was um it was quite alienating and and some not so great experiences you know being talked down to being ignored you know not getting my input through um maybe not having the technical terminology to relate to make my input more relatable but um you know also just like uh, my horror story of you know walking into a bathroom in a very famous studio in LA uh where we were mixing and I go into this bathroom and it's just like wall to wall naked photos of naked women like centerfolds and I was just like I mean I'm cool I'm cool you know I love the female body is nothing to be ashamed of but it was also just like it just reeked of man vibe like it just really every time I've gone into a studio it's really been a man cave not super welcoming mm -hmm. um the the air kind of change you know you walk into the room and it's something shifts like people are not talking to each other probably the way they might if there weren't any women there so you really just start feeling self-conscious right away and what I love about what Isabel Banos is doing and what Sarah McDougall's doing in London and people who are opening their own studios is I feel like there's a much this may seem cliche but this is just what I've been witnessing with women owning the space and owning the gear and owning the um sort of ethos behind a studio there's a lot more attention to the artist's well-being and and self-care so there you know I, I kind of joke but it's true like I've seen people you know you walk in and they're yoga mats would you like to you know stretch or meditate before we start our session you know would you like a green tea would you you know like um, there are plants and there's beautiful wallpaper and like comfy couches not like the cold leather uh, they both know. have their dogs with them all the time yeah animals and and loved ones like it's just it's I such I, I really look back on the experiences I had as a as a recording artist and and I wish like I wish I could you know have just been transported into the future and and recorded in studios like that even the even the ISO booths are just so warm and you know there are candles and there's like you know, aromatherapy, it's just kind of like, oh, this is so soothing. And now I feel comfortable and safe and like I can create and nothing creepy is going to happen to me. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. Um, I think, uh, I think a lot of, um, a lot of what, you know, you're speaking to is also, um, see, I, I struggle saying it's like unintentional, you know, or intentional. Um, but it, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it, I think, um, having studio spaces operate in, in, in settings and environments that are, um, shall we say, uh, you know, not quite, you know, intentionally, I think not appealing, um, or made to feel safe, uh, for women, women identifying presence. Um, that that's been a part of the, that framework and, and the, just the industry in general, um, you know, for so long. And Kim, you know, you speaking about being a drummer and being like the only woman in the room, I think, um, you know, it, there's been drips and drabs of women, women identifying presence, you know, over, over time. And, and now hopefully, you know, this, there's a continuation of, of surgeons. Um, it's a constant, it's a constant uphill battle. Like it, I mean, even just in terms of getting comfortable, I think, um, People like seeing people that they that reflect or or mirror themselves. So it's cyclic because if there's a lot of men in the room, men are going to want to see a reflection of you know, something that's comfortable, reminds them of himself. So you know the whole imposter syndrome thing. By the way, it's women and women identifying who usually use that term. P.S. You know, um, you know the whole idea of imposter syndrome is well, I don't fit in. Yeah, you don't fit in. You're in a room full of men. Of course, you don't fit in. So I think it's really about changing, let's change the room, right? Um, I, I mean, I, I get on my soapbox about this, but I appreciate your candor. Well, because that, change, that changes the conversation. If you change the room, you change the conversation. You change the song. Yeah, you change the song. Exactly. Yeah. No, I really appreciate the, the transparency. And, you know, mentorship too. We've been chatting about how, you know, through WITS, um, having mentorship from you know, trailblazing, successful woman, woman identifying um, creatives in the space uh, can be very helpful in terms of planting those seeds of 
this is possible, visibility, accessibility, all of these commodities of the industry, because they are very much commodities. Um, you know, I personally really resonated with, you know, one of the mentors Brick brought in was Linda Perry. And, uh, you know, Linda gave me this great opportunity, actually, as a direct result of the program, where I reimagined um, the four non-blonde song, What's Up, for Blumhouse Productions. Um, it was their Welcome to the Blumhouse. It was like a four-part horror feature film uh, release series. And What's Up was the common thread needling through the films. Um, and, you know, Linda, Linda and I connected as a result of WITS. You know, so that I think I moonwalked out of the room, I'm pretty sure. And she was like, yeah, you're super weird, but okay. Um, and uh, I, that led, though, to fabulous opportunities for myself. And I think just having that belief system in place, like, oh, Linda believes I can do this, you know, and having that be something born from the WITS environment, uh, you know, I can connect those dots now. You know, I can see that lineage. Oh, yeah. That, that led to this, this led to that domino effect. I think, you know, that's kind of what a career really is. It's connecting. Yeah. And yeah. this connecting the dots on that one is uh, Linda came in, thanks to Cheryl Link up here, who's one of our main mentors. Um, Vivian Barkley from Warner Chapel is the chair of our board, but also very active in this program. And Michelle Pack from Sony Publishing Canada. Um, and we have new mentors and uh, joining us every day and we couldn't do it without the mentors the volunteers our publishers and all of our sponsors um i've got to um um thank i'm going to do shameless thanking here um the factor and and the government of canada and ontario crates who believed in us in that very first program and rbc who just came in with a three-year sponsorship so that we could do more with our alumni uh, all really important people who see this vision and and want to take this journey with us. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it truly takes a village, right. To be able to bring these things to fruition. So I think that's wonderful. And that also speaks to, you know, the cross pollination. I think that's so necessary to the landscape between people and organizations and communities. And, um, you know, hopefully that just continues on forward. Um, you know, more voices, it's not noise, right? Like I think there's so many voices of things. It's not noise. It's just um, how do we highlight and bring out voices and pair voices with one another? Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I, I credit um, WITS and all of the amazing, you know, sponsors and, you know, people who can bring that um, to the forefront. So that's fabulous. And if anybody listening to this is looking for a producer, we have all of our alum listed on our website, musicpublishing.ca, including you, Alex. <laughs> and uh, you, <laughs> you can you can write to us at info at musicpublishing.ca if you have um, questions and then we um, we put out the call for applicants at um, on Instagram at and can at can use pub perfect amazing good and I mean so I just want to just to, to before we open up to q and a if if there is any you know q and a to be had fabulous if not totally cool um but just to go over the main kind of highlight points here applications for you know the upcoming season of women in the studio opens march right yes and where can one find the application margaret you just said on socials right online and yeah, um, on Instagram, you can find it at Instagram. Can Muse Pub and on our, it'll be on also the main page of our website. Perfect. Amazing. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you both before, you know, we'll open up for a Q&A. Um, but, you know, what most excites you about the future you know, season to come, like this future program? Is it a continuation of an excitement building off of the past five years um, or is there anything in, in particular um, that most excites you? Kim? Oh, well, I mean, it's so new to us to have enough cohorts now that we can start pulling from the grads and saying, we know you're an expert in this. Somebody, you know, one person knows the inside and out of TikTok. They can come and talk to us about their experience uh, building their career around that, or someone can come in and do a how to build your home studio session, you know, um, just being able to, to 
cull from all of the amazing graduates of the program, but also follow their progress and celebrate all of your wins is so amazing. Um, what else are we looking forward to in this year, Margaret? Do you have any? Well, I love, I'm a policy geek and I'm a, a royalties geek. And I spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one even with the producers talking about how to make money in this industry and and uh, following the different royalty pipes. So I geek out on that all the time. I'm in a deep rabbit hole right now on AI and there's going to be a lot in that space. So um, look at our website. We just put a position paper on under resources. Um, so while Kim leads uh, Women in the Studio and I'm there um, helping, um, I also um, am really excited about the year ahead and the potential of of what we can do together as a music community and in, in reference to making sure you're gonna, all going to make money on AI. Okay. Yeah. I mean, making money is important. It's the vehicle that makes the world go round. We want to build sustainable careers. Yeah. I mean, sustainability, longevity, I think that's kind of, yeah, super key. And that's, yeah, really appreciated. Um, just both of your work uh, in helping propel that dialogue and that conversation forward. Um, yeah, it's super significant and, and, you know, very grateful for your everything, your time and effort in that space. Um, so do we have any any questions? If not, totally cool. Um, but if if you do speak now, forever hold your peace. No questions? That's cool. Also, I mean, I don't know if this is cool, but I would love to hear from people who are in the room, if you're comfortable with it, just unmuting and telling us who you are and where you're located and a little yeah. bit about yourselves. Yeah, I'd love that. No takers? That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi. Um, sorry, I was just sitting here eating my breakfast. Um, <laughs> I'm Kat. I'm from Vancouver. Um, I work as a producer and composer and musician, a session musician. Um, yeah, I'm really interested to apply to this. I came just to kind of as an info session. I wasn't sure what it was about. Um, I didn't unmute myself quickly enough, but Margaret, where do I find that paper you wrote about the AI? Um, on musicpublishing.ca under resources and if you go down to the advocacy section uh advocacy okay i'm also nerding out about ai right now so i'd love to chat more about it yeah anytime <laughs> thanks nice to meet you all Hi. <laughs> i guess i'll go next i'm michelle and i am from toronto canada as well hello torontonians and mm -hmm. i didn't really know much about this program either so i just sort of tuned in because i follow the awfc so um I'm a co emerging composer, I guess you could say, maybe not, not, don't have my own studio or anything like that, but um, uh, have done, you know, music for documentaries, music for screen, and also do concerts and orchest orchestral and instrumental. So, um, yeah, the idea of songwriting is something I've done, but never really done the production side of it, like just me, myself and I production. So it's just interesting, to, but I appreciated Alex, your comment about how the higher bubble is sort of just that creative and you just never know, you know, how one thing is linked to another. So, yeah, it's just, it's been informative and I didn't know anything about this. So it's great. Thanks. Tell your friends. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I guess my turn. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, so it's uh, Anna. Uh, Anna Schweitz from uh, France. I'm actually in Toulouse, so that, that's why I uh, asked about the possibilities for international candidates uh, to apply. I'm a professionally trained uh, musician, so I finished a, a music academy uh, as a composer with master's in music composition. Then I made the PhD in um, computation musicology, and now I work as a researcher in the AI. Uh, so I'm writing music for uh, the VR projects and um basically so yeah i mean um i'm very much interested in that as well and yeah well can you uh, can you tell me whether it's actually possible for me for reply or it's uh, rather unfortunately no okay. but you may you may want to look at she said so it's okay. another uh, more European based program okay thank you much so yeah i guess that, that's it Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. It was uh, uh, very insightful and uh, it was very cool to 
uh, to know that that uh, that kind of initiative exists for women, uh, even if you can imply. But you know, in general, yes, I think that actually changes the uh, the business and the situation. And um, yeah, uh, my my sincere congratulations for all those initiatives you took to actually to develop that for for women and uh, uh, minorities. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And I think, um, yeah, maybe look into the, she, Margaret, it's called, she said, she, she said, said so. so here, I'll just yeah. put it in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, perfect. It's in the chat. And then there's, she is the music in, uh, in the US right. and some of the territories. Yeah. Right. Perfect. I'll do workshops and different song camps. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think um, also, Michelle, just to your point um, before, I don't know, Christine, if you wanted to also pop in, say, I can hop uh, in. You can finish your thought first. And okay, I can cool. Because I, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. Um, but just, just Michelle, to your. By the way, Michelle, were you at the TIFF event, the AWC? Yeah, yeah I recognize you. You look familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh good. Hi. Cool. Um, sorry. The um, yeah. Just to the point of that higher bubble, the umbrella. I think. I think that's so true. I think sometimes it's lost uh, in the sauce a bit. The fact that. Um, when you compose right like when i compose i'm if i'm at my daw you know when i'm inputting the midi controller and then i'm mixing as i go and then i'm producing right that music production actually occurs within the music composition process right yeah so i think that's something it's interesting when you talk about like yeah that i think there's all these multiple spaces but really this higher kind of place that they're all stemming out of mm -hmm. um and they all feed into one another so yeah, um, definitely. I think, uh, you know, if you don't think you're a music producer, you are a music producer if you're composing. You know, I just right. know it. I just yeah. know you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, Christine, sorry. I don't want to okay. cut you off. <laughs> no, you're fine. I am also not in Canada. I'm in Austin, Texas. Um, I joined AWFC literally yesterday because I just did <laughs> like a crazy career change and I'm doing online classes and I started composing like five months ago. Um but I love it. I absolutely love it. And the more I do it, the more I'm really interested in the production piece of everything and how it all just works together. And I love um, the collaboration piece that you guys talked a lot about. So I'm really excited. I wrote down both of those um, other programs that you guys talked about. I'm just excited to see what else is, is out there and just trying to learn as much as I can. So here we go. <laughs> We're always happy to talk to other countries about our program. We want to find... Um, gigs for our producers around the world to work. And um, I just did a, a seminar um, out of the, the EU looking at more programs and we'd love to collaborate. Yeah, it sounds incredible. So excited for everyone that gets to <laughs> <laughs> apply. <laughs> Yeah. What, um, sorry, what were you in before you made the switch? Sorry if it's also, you don't want to say, but. No, like I was running HR at a law firm. Oh, whoa. And, but okay. I grew up, I, um, I grew up playing the piano. I started playing piano when I was four and singing and did clarinet here and there. And I didn't realize that I have, like, I have melodies in my head and I didn't know that. And when I think of a melody, I think of other counter melodies on top of it. And I didn't know that. And then I just kind of got yeah. to a point where I wanted to figure out what a long-term career would look like and gave myself permission for music to be that thing. So. Love that. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Oh, that's that's truly awesome. Nice. Also, HR for a law firm. Wow, you smart, huh? Yeah, that's, job. that's a big job. That's fine. Yeah, it was rough. It was rough. <laughs> Burned me out rough. pretty pretty good. So uh -huh. nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you're background to have though. That is good background to have. It's been really interesting. You guys mentioned um, just the threads. You know, different hats under com like big umbrellas, and I have kind of background in small business ownership and, and launching different businesses and helping people with that as well. So like just the tech side, the marketing side, the running campaigns for yourself side, I didn't realize the how all of those things would actually help with the music and that the music kind of came naturally and all of those things are kind of in the background ready to <laughs> ready well, to go. And we're, and we're spending a lot, I'm that. spending a lot of time on the HR side and yeah. um, if you go to, under resources, we released a report last year that was put together by an HR consultant on um, tools for small businesses, because a lot of small mm -hmm. 
publishing companies don't have HR people, but they right. need those supports, especially if they want a more diversified staff. Absolutely. It just, it goes to show that nothing is linear. <laughs> Everything you're doing will help you no matter what. And it's never too late. So translatable. <laughs> I'm a lobbyist. My grade 10 self didn't even know that job existed. So, and Neat. it's the best job ever. So I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> so cool. Iron for the fodder. I think actually, Christine, that's like a beautiful sentiment to kind of like wrap this up on like that nothing is linear and that um it's never too late i love i think that's actually a perfect way to kind of in summation um the session i want to thank again um margaret and kim for you know spending your time joining and you know sharing your valuable insight perspectives on women in the studio program and otherwise um, today for this AWFC Inside session. And for everyone who tuned in, thank you so much for tuning in um, from all parts. All per I love I love it because I was like, I'm not sure, is this going to be like my neighbors literally or who's tuning in? So we're from all around, um, which is fabulous. And uh, this will be also posted on the AWFC YouTube um, as a recording as well. Um, so, but yeah, I want to thank everyone for joining, tuning in today. I'm Alex Pekovsky. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really hopeful and motivated after this discussion today. And I hope you are too. Thanks, yeah. Alex. Thank nice you. To you. Nice, nice to meet to you, everyone. You. Take care. Bye.